Welcome to the Open Forum. Again, we have the uh, wonderful opportunity, the wonderful privilege, the wonderful pleasure of looking together into the Word of God. Oh, yes, it is a pleasure if we're truly trying to serve God, uh, pleading for Him, to Him for mercy. But it is not a pleasure if we are mocking God, if we are scoffing at God, if we're not taking the Bible absolutely seriously. Then as we look into the Bible, we find statements, we find verses uh, that uh, we don't like at all. And we feel very offended to keep reading and we'd rather not listen anymore. But my, my, how wonderful it is that God has given us his word. But shall this is your program, and so shall we take our first call uh, and with the, this individual's question. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, Happy New Year to you. Thank you. And I'd like to, to ask you a question. I was watching the History Channel tonight, and they were mentioning the <clears> fact <throat> that they say there's some biblical evidence, the fact that UFOs came down and they were pointing in Genesis about the giants uh, and in some parts of Ezekiel where they said that they were to be interpreted as being UFOs. Can you comment on that, please? Well, first of all, there are no UFOs. That is strictly in a man's imagination. But you must remember, our minds are very tricky. And when the these very uh, famous scientists uh, who believe in evolution are, are quite sure that there are other stars out there that have planets around them, just like our sun has planets. And uh, certainly, uh, as this world, uh, this universe has evolved, as they claim to understand it, uh, there should be other Earths out there that support life. They may be way, way out there, but there should be some that support life. All right, now when you start that thinking and you start thinking about that, the next thing you're going to be thinking, well, then it could be that there could be aliens that are trying to get in contact with us or even have visited our Earth. And so our minds get carried away, and the next thing, uh, people even uh, come believe that they have talked to aliens, and uh, they have seen uh, uh, aliens, little green men of some kind or another, and uh, yet there is no evidence of any kind. Nobody can disrupt the way a nut or a bolt that came from a, a spacecraft, an alien spacecraft, it is all in the mind of man. The, the, the Bible has nothing, nothing to say. But that's what you do when your mind is going and, and imagining things. Then you begin to read the Bible with that imagination in mind. And the next thing you read a verse about giants in Genesis 6, and you say, well, then maybe they are you... Uh, they are aliens of some kind, and the, the context doesn't allow that at all. No place in the Bible does it allow that possibility. So uh, just uh, just uh, realize that all of this is pure imagination. Thank you, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, you say that uh, when Christ was ministering for three and a half years, you know, very few people were getting saved. Yes. Uh, a famine. And uh, so you use a number of uh, verses like John 1, 11, and then some other ones. And so some of the question is, what, uh, what do you do with these verses here? I can give off about three of them. Uh, first one is uh, John chapter 2, verse 23. John chapter 2. And then there's two other verses related to that. Well, let me That's look not at the that. only one. There are two other ones. Well, let's first of all look at John chapter 2, verse 23. There we read... 
In verse 3, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Now, notice what it says. That many believed in his name when they saw the miracle. It doesn't mean it was salvation or believing unto salvation. It was simply, oh, this man is a, he made, does miracles. Uh, we really trust him as our savior because he does miracles. It's not because God gave him them the faith to believe. Uh, because we don't believe in Christ just because he does miracles. We believe in Christ because God has opened our eyes to the fact that he is our Savior, that God has done all that work. But the phrase, because they, when they saw miracles, betrays the fact that this was a, what we theologically might call miraculous faith, is believing in him because he did miracles, okay, how about not chap- because he's the Savior. Okay, how about chapter 4, verse 41, then? Mark, Matthew chapter 4, verse 21. F- 41. For he, he that doeth truth... I'm sorry, 41. Or, 41. Or verse 41. No, no, no. Ch- or chapter 4, verse 41? Yes. Okay, I'll get there. Ch- Genesis chapter 4. No, John chapter 4. John, excuse me. John chapter 4, verse 41. Uh and many more believe believe because of his own word. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him, I'm reading verse 40, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Now, here he's not talking to the Jews. He's talking to the Samaritans. The Samaritans were despised by the Jews because they were half breeds. Okay, they, okay, how about how about John chapter six verse fifteen then? John I know John John chapter six uh verse uh, yeah fifteen. John six verse, 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 verse fifteen. 15. There we read when Jesus therefore perceived they would come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again into the mountain himself alone. So they now, believed so much they wanted to make him king. In this case what the problem is, they saw in him and as an earthly king. They were looking for him, uh, for a king, uh, a messiah that would free them from Roman rule, because they were under the under the uh, rule of the Romans, and they hated that with a passion. Oh, and I here see. comes this miracle worker, uh, this rabbi who is able to do all these wonderful things, uh, heal the sick, heal the lepers, and my, he must be the king who is going to free us from Roman rule. In other words, uh, he's going to uh, establish a literal, physical kingdom here on yeah, planet understand. Earth. But okay. they were not looking upon him as Savior. No, they were looking upon him as a literal king to I free understand. them from Roman rule. Okay, thank you, Mr. Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes, welcome to Open Forum. Thank you for um, allowing me to inquire about the recent article that I read. Yes. Um, uh, an expected... Um, Return of Christ on May the 21st. Yes. And I was wondering if you could explain the scripture about no man knoweth the day nor the hour. Yes, that's very easy to explain because if we go to Acts chapter 1 verse 7 or chapter or verse 8, God explains there that uh, it was God's intention that throughout the church age, as long as God was using the church to represent the kingdom of God in the world, uh, no one was to know the time of Christ's return. We read in Acts chapter 1, verse uh, 7, or verse 8, uh, uh, no, excuse me, verse 6, when they, the disciples, who are the beginning of the New Testament church, 
When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? That to them was, would uh, happen at, uh, when God's salvation program was completed. They didn't have as much understanding as we have today about God's salvation program. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in unto the uttermost part of the earth. In other words, Christ is saying, don't you spend your energy and your thinking time on when the end might come. You get busy with the task I have assigned to you of bringing the gospel to the world. And that's reinforced by all these statements in Mark and in Matthew, for example. No one can know the time. But on the other hand, uh, God uh, also indicates that when the time came when God was finished with the churches and when we worked very, very carefully through all the biblical evidence, we find that God was finished with the churches in 1988, 1955 years after he began the, uh, the New Testament church, uh, that at that time, God did begin to give additional information that had been given to in the book of Daniel or uh, had been given to Daniel, but he was told to seal it up. It is for the time of the end. And they we're living in the time of the end, and so God has given us a lot more information so that today we know what the time is. We have to know because God has also commanded us to warn the world that Judgment Day is about here. And, uh, and and he's given us the time and a lot of the detail of Judgment Day. And so we must know. And so today, uh, as uh, this also becomes a, 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 a sign that we're at the end. Uh, because today, in the churches, if you ask anybody... Uh, uh, do you know that Christ is coming on May 21? They'll, they'll ordinarily answer and say, No, 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 he's coming as a thief in the night. And then if you ask that individual, uh, But are you ready to meet him if he's coming? Oh, yes, he could come tonight or he could come next week or a year from now. I am ready. And God refers to that in First Thessalonians 5 as a sign that uh, that this would happen, that uh, there would be those who will say, yes, he's coming as a thief in the night, but I am ready. That is, the, the, I have peace and safety in Christ, but sudden destruction will come upon them because they're not listening to the whole Bible. They're just listening to what had been taught uh, prior to the time when God opened the information that had been given to Daniel. And it's all uh, has been written in the Bible, but now it is uh, available to us, and that includes the time and the details of Judgment Day that He has given. And uh, and so it is. Uh, if you read First Thessalonians chapter five, First Thessalonians chapter five, the first seven or eight verses, you'll find there two kinds of people. Those who say, no, he's coming as a thief in the night, but I am ready, and sudden destruction will come upon them. But on the other hand, there are those who are watching, that is, they're searching the Bible constantly, and they have, and because we're living in a time when God had, uh, has, wants us to know the time, uh, that we have learned what the time is, so that we in turn can warn the world that May 21 is Judgment Day. Okay, well, do you associate um, the uh, recent sudden deaths of the 5,000 birds in Arkansas and the 100,000 drumfish to signs and wonders that, you know, Christ is soon to return? We, and uh, we can't. what about the um, Philadelphia experiment with the U.S. Aldridge? Would you say that 
maybe those uh, dates from the U.S. Aldridge where every 10 years from the date that they first started the experiment might be um, more accurate that something is to occur no, since excuse 1943, me. Uh, uh, 53, 63, 73, 83, 93, 2003. Uh, so then the next uh, decade would be uh, 2013, or would the Mayans be more accurate? Excuse me, the Mayans had no accuracy at all. In fact, they weren't talking about the end of the world as the Bible talks about the end of the world. They were talking about the end of an era, but they were speculating, and uh, they uh, came up with a date of 2012 that is similar to 2011, are very close to it, but they have no truth at all. There's nothing going to happen in 2012 because the world won't even exist then. And so the uh, we don't look, look at and any of these other physical events that you mentioned have nothing to do with the end of the world. The signs are are spiritual. The signs like the. Uh, the gay pride move, movement is one of the big signs, the, the sign uh, of Israel becoming a nation again in 1948. That It was a big sign, the fact that they would never believe in uh, as a nation in Christ as their Savior. It was another sign that is, uh, it pointed to the fact that we're right at the end. And the sign of... Uh, of the uh, fantastic wickedness that's going on in the world today on every area in the politicians and in the churches and in the and in the business world the the deception the greed the uh, 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 and all these other things these are the signs that point to us as well as we have all this information about the timeline of history that came right out of the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. The number to call is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And... Shall we take Hello? our next call? Hello? Welcome to Open Forum. Um, yes, go ahead with your call. Deuteronomy 9.10. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10. Yes. Let's look at that. Genesis. Yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10. Ten. There we read, And Jehovah delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were written according to all the words which Jehovah spake with you in the mount of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. Now, what is your question? Well, I need to compare that with a couple of others. Can you read... Verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 4. Verse, chapter 10, verse 4. And he wrote on the tables, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which Jehovah spake unto you in the mount of, out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly, and Jehovah gave them unto me. Okay, now can you look at John chapter 8, verse 6, please? John 8, verse 6. Let's look at that. John 8... Verse 6, there we read, this they said, now uh, let's talk, let's start with verse 5, and Moses in the law commanded thus that sh 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 such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? And this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his fingers wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Uh, it's talking about the woman taken in adultery, and and uh, they're asking Jesus, trying to test him. Uh, should he, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't this woman be stoned to death according to the law of the Old Testament? And that, of course, would have put Jesus in trouble with the Romans because 
uh, the uh, the uh, in the Rome according to the Roman law there had to be a trial and the death was normally by crucifixion so Jesus avoided all that by writing stooping down and writing on the ground just like he was writing the Ten Commandments right uh, that's was I was once, I was going to ask you to read just one more voice uh, well this one more verse eight eight. It's a short one. Well, John 8, verse 8. John 8, verse 8. We read, And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it became convicted by their own conscience and went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. Now, what is your question? question now. Was the Lord Jesus showing us that it was he who wrote the Ten Commandments? Joe, Jesus was again. showing that he, Jesus was showing that he is God. And just as he wrote his, with his finger on the ground, uh, uh, so God wrote with his finger on the tablets of stone and gave the Ten Commandments. And you're very correct that there's a direct relationship there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yeah, I have a question first. Uh, first, I wanted to say, I read in the Bible about the woman with two mites. She put in all she had, and she trusted God would take care of any needs she had. Uh, I was wondering if, since you teach the world's going into May the 21st, why don't you take all your money out of the bank and give it for, like, Reader's Digest? Don't you trust God like she did? Or are you just keeping it just in case? Well, oh, excuse me. I don't uh, know. But what is your question? Uh, should or, or your question is, should we take all our money out why of don't the you? bank and you. give it away? Uh, or, sh or should I? Well, why why would I do that? Uh, the because goddess, you'll be wasted. Money excuse will be wasted me. if you don't. Excuse me. I... Uh, when the day of judgment comes, when May 21 comes, uh, there are people who have billions of dollars and they're going to be worth zero. Because what are you going to do with billions of dollars when the whole earth is uh, being destroyed and, uh, and, and, and death is everywhere and you yourself might already die on that first day of the day of judgment? Why? And if you're a true believer... Well, uh, uh, why do crazy things with your money or even uh, because you're going to leave it all behind when you go to be with Christ and it doesn't it, 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 money you see money is is what mankind loves and uh, this is this is the love of money which is the root of many kinds of evil and uh, it causes all kinds of, of tensions and wickedness in the world and and uh, we don't have, we shouldn't have our mi mind on money we ought to have our mind on Christ that's that's where our mind ought to be but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum yes camping yes you keep cutting me off man can't get a point through to you at all you keep running and running and running i have a comment and then a question you keep stating that God's name is mentioned 7,000 times in the Old Testament. But he also said God is not his name twice. You never made mention of that. Or maybe you cannot. Another thing is, you say that God does not have a name for identification, which I think is the most ridiculous statement I've heard on the radio now what is your I, question excuse me now what is your question I said I have a comment and then a question I'm making a comment are you afraid to hear the comment that I have uh, well please uh, you made a what comment said, you a made two ago, comments so, excuse me, to me. Uh, excuse me you've already made two comments you've said that God's name is mentioned 7,000 times in the Old Testament and uh, but not the name Christ. Well, the fact is, God's name is uh, m named more than seven thousand. The word Jehovah is of over seven thousand times. But in addition, God is called a, a God. He's called uh, 
uh, the Father, he's called, uh, and in the New Testament, God is called Jesus, he's called Christ, he's called Lord, he's called Faithful, he's called uh, 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 the, uh, many other names that God is called. Now, what is your question? Please, no more comment. Mm -hmm. What is you, your question? This is how you run the program. Anytime someone had a va have a valid question to ask you or make a comment, you cut them off. Excuse me, excuse me. If you do not have a question, we're going on to our next caller. Now, do you have a question? Thank you. Do you, you. want to hear my question? Yes. What is your question? Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Matthew. Oh, Matthew. 28, 19, and 20. There we read, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in to the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And okay. lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, what is okay. your question? Here's my question. If there is not identification in that verse, which of the apostles baptized anyone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? The three gods you keep talking about. Well, the uh, baptizing... Uh, 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 excuse me, uh, would you repeat your question? I didn't quite which get it. Which of the apostles... Baptize anyone in John uh, twenty-eight nineteen. Which of the apostles? Oh, uh, Give me now, a verse, a scripture. Now the fact is that uh, that uh, the the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are God. Are God. Uh, he sometimes uh, uh, speaks of himself in the singular, sometimes in the plural, and that's we don't understand God. On the other hand. Uh, we also find it says baptizing in the name of God or just in the name of Jesus, but it's always God. Thank you for calling. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Greetings and love for heights, Brother Harold. Uh, my question is, since Yeshua, the one that everyone calls Jesus, since Yeshua says that he did not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it, do you agree with me that we should try to live our life as Yeshua, as Jesus did, including keeping the Saturday, seventh-day Sabbath, which was ordained at the beginning of creation? Well, first of all, uh, we Yahweh. Have... The name that my brother was looking for when he called before was Yahweh El Elyon, blessed and hallowed be his name. Go ahead. What was your answer to the question about keeping the seventh day Sabbath as opposed to keeping the Sabbath, the Sunday, false Sunday Sabbath ordained by Constantine that is to honor Horus, the sun god, Helios, in a new religion formed by Rome that was a, a part of the... Yeah, no, excuse me, excuse me. No, you, uh, you've asked your question. Uh, okay. Shall we try to live our life by obeying the whole law of God? Absolutely. And the problem is because there are many people today who do not understand what God is teaching about the seventh day Sabbath. They think that by rigorously keeping it today, uh, they are obeying the law, whereas in actuality, they are disobeying the law. The law is the whole Bible. And, uh, and uh, uh, churches or documents that talk about keeping the seventh-day Sabbath do not ever talk about the fact that, like in Ex Ex Exodus chapter, uh, 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 God indicated that the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Sabbath day was, uh, was a sign pointing to the fact that God sanctifies us. It was a ceremonial law. Uh, it sure, just no, like, uh, sure excuse me, excuse me. Now, it was a ceremonial law. It was not a moral law. 
It was a law that was pointing to the fact that just as God did not work on the seventh day of salvation, of creation, and uh, remember in Deuteronomy 5, where God also gave the Ten Commandments, remember he said, keep the seventh day Sabbath, uh, because I brought you out of Egypt with a high hand in, uh, on your way to the land of Canaan. I'm paraphrasing, but that's approximately what is stated there. Now, why did he say that? Because it is a, a day in which God is teaching that he did all the work of saving us. And if you try to do a little bit of work trying uh, to get saved, then you are like someone who did some work on the seventh day. And if you go to Numbers 15, you find there that a man picked up some sticks on the seventh day Sabbath and God told him to be executed. I, Moses uh, was told to stone him to death because it's like someone who is trying to keep the law of God and, and put his trust in his keeping a part of the law of God, like accepting Jesus or getting baptized in water or something of that nature. And that helped to get himself saved. And so uh, the problem is uh, uh, there, there's a lot of literature and there are churches that believe that we have to keep the seventh-day Sabbath and to keep all the law. But in actuality, they are in total rebellion against God because they're not reading the whole Bible. They're not following the law that says that we are to compare Scripture with Scripture. They don't ever teach this matter of you are to keep the seventh day because I, the Lord, sanctified thee. That is, it's a ceremonial law. So I'm sorry. And, the, and if you haven't read those verses, then, of course, you won't understand. You won't agree with me. You will argue with me. But, uh, but we have to use the whole Bible if we're going to uh, really come to truth. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our, whole, our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Jonah 4, 5 through 11. Jonah chapter 4, let's go back to that. Jonah, Jonah chapter 4, verse 5 to 11. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, which verse particularly do you want to look at? Because there, there's, a, these are, there's a lot of statements in these four, six okay. verses, and you couldn't possibly ask a question that would cover all these statements. Which, which uh, verse uh, are you going to want to focus shadows. on? Evil shadows. Um, is it related to Ezekiel 31, 3, 6, 12, and 17? Is it, when it's talking here about uh, uh, the fact that... Uh, uh, let me just read a couple of verses in Jonah. Uh, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat it under it in the sh in shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And Jehovah God prepared a gourd and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd, but God prepared a worm when the morning arose the next day, and it smote the guard that it withered, and so on. Now, now you want to compare that with uh, Ezekiel chapter 31. Let's go to that, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 31, verse 3 and 6. Let's look at a couple of these. Uh, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of a high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great, and the deep set him up on high with her rivers running round about his plants and sent out her little rivers under all the trees of the field. This is a parable that God is giving Ezekiel or giving all of us, and I have not worked through it very uh, recently or very carefully, and so I'm not really qualified to answer your question at all. Uh, because on the one hand, the language of Jonah is very difficult in itself. 
there's a lot of parab uh, it's parabolic language also even though it's all historical it's still parabolic and this is another parable uh, that is uh, just a story it is not an actual uh, historical fact like it was in the book of Jonah but I am not qualified to try to compare the two I'm sorry can I ask another question or uh, no excuse me Thank you for calling. I'm sure. I'm sorry. We one question to each individual. I'm sorry, but shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome Hello? to Open Forum. Oh yeah. Am I on? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, I had a question um, regarding. Um, you were saying that uh, Satan rules in the churches, and that we should uh, get out of the churches. But could there be churches that don't really, really, really say that they're churches, but really are churches? I mean, how do we really know what it, what, it, what is a church and what isn't a church? How do we really know what is a church and yeah. what isn't a church? The church has very distinct characteristics that are given in the Bible. A church has a membership because... And it has those who have spiritual oversight over those who are members. Uh, the church is commanded by God to administer water baptism upon those who uh, believe they have become saved. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, only uh, that has to be under the, uh, the guidance or the control of those who have the spiritual rule of the church. The church is to offer from time to time, the, the, the number of times is not given in the Bible, uh, the, the, the um, uh, Lord's table, as uh, to remind people to look back on the, what happened uh, as God demonstrated on the cross, how he made payment for our sins, and look forward also to the completion of our salvation. And uh, these things are uh, should be found in every church, and ordinarily they are. Uh, but uh, but uh, if a gr group of people assemble together, and there's no membership, and there's no uh, uh, sacraments, that is, no water baptism, there's no Lord's table, uh, there are no people who have the spiritual oversight who can, uh, who can uh, 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 be acting like a pastor or elders or deacons. Uh, then you uh, just have a place of assembly, and there, it should be totally different from a church. Well, there are churches that, that don't have memberships that, that do call themselves churches. What, what, what would you think of those? What about churches that don't have? Membership. Well, then they're not. They are. are they're <laughs> trying to be a church, but they are not being faithful to the Word of God. They are not being faithful. You, you, just because God gave the rules, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, a, a church, if if they're if they're offering uh, water baptism in the Lord's table and they don't have a membership, they still are a church because they are doing things that God has commanded that are only to be done in the church. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Hello? Forum. Yes. Oh, hi there. Um, I'm just wondering, where in the Bible does it say we become non-existent if we are unsaved? Because when I read the New Testament... It talks all the time about a burning, you know, like burning hell and stuff, and that you're going to be um, with gnashing teeth. And I was just wondering, where in the Bible does it say we, be, you know, like say our unlo you know, our loved ones are unsaved and stuff? Um, do they co become un? Do they just become you know um, non-existent? You have asked a very good question. Uh, in um, in uh, Jonah chapter uh, Jonah it only has one chapter uh, in verse 7 God describes what he means when he talks again and again about eternal fire uh, and, and that's sprinkled in many places in the Bible and immediately 
uh, the churches of the past have always taught that that fire goes on and it burns eternally and the people who are under the wrath of God are there and uh, and suffering uh, for billions of years in that fire even though the Bible says the wages of sin is death death the Bible doesn't say the wages of sin is to be in a place where you're going to be punished for, for billions of years but the language of eternal fire which is used very frequently in connection with the wrath of God gives us the idea that it will go on and on and on for billions of years but in the book of Jude Jude that little book just before the book of Revelation God ex it defines what he means by eternal fire. Uh, first of all, uh, the reason God uses a fire a whole lot in connection with uh, talking about his wrath is because uh, we read in Hebrews chapter 13, I believe it is, uh, that God is a consuming fire. Uh, uh, now, it doesn't mean that God is... Uh, is uh, like a great big bonfire, but that is the language God is using as a consuming fire. And so whenever God is, frequently when God is talking about his wrath, he uses the word fire, coming under the fire of God's wrath. It's because he is a consuming fire, not because there's literally a fire. Now, and then furthermore, in verse 7 of Jude, God talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Well, now, now God demonstrates back in Genesis 19 how Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboam, the other two cities, were destroyed. And is that they were destroyed by fire. Now, is that fire still burning? We can go to the location where Sodom and Gomorrah were. It's somewhere near the Dead Sea. And there's no fire burning there at all. Well, but it's eternal fire. So what God is saying, look, be careful now with that word eternal fire. It doesn't mean the fire burns eternally. It means that those who are destroyed, like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, are eternally destroyed. In other words, if they're eternally destroyed, uh, then it means they no longer have any existence. They are annihilated. And, uh, and, and, we, and we know that, and God says, here, this is an example of what I mean by eternal fire. It isn't the fire that burns. It isn't the punishment that goes on forever and ever. It's the fact that it, 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 it causes eternal death. You become annihilated at the time of God's wrath finally coming upon, uh, upon you. And uh, this is just one passage that illustrates that there is no continuing punishment. There are many passages that speak about it. it's all going to uh, uh, come to a full end. That there's a, that there's no uh, the wages of sin is death. Is death. It doesn't say the wages of sin is to burn eternally in a place or or, or for billions of years under the suffering of God. It's the wages of sin is death. And when you're dead, you're dead. Uh, and you no longer have conscious existence. Uh, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have for, a good night. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, let's go to Ezra 8.18. Ezra 18. Let's look at that. 8.18. Uh, Ezra, Ezra chapter 8, verse 18, we read, And by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding of the sons of Mali, Mali 
the son of Levi, the son of Israel, and Sherebiah with his sons and his brethren, 18. And, uh, so, and now what is your question? Um, I'm not really quite prepared, but uh, all I have to say, Harold, for the people that are on the air, it takes intense study to really study and be committed to the Holy Bible. And um, I, give all the God, or I give all the God the glory for you. You are a man of great nature, and, and these are the proper props, because, you, cause, because this is the man that is speaking here. I, I, I give you all the glory. I give, I give God all the glory for you. What a man you are. I well, thank, thank you for calling and sharing, and I'm glad you say I give God all the glory because I want no glory at all. Who am I? I'm just, I'm just a hay there. I'm, I, I just don't understand how God has laid it upon my heart to want to study the Bible and has opened my eyes to a little truth here and a little truth there, but I and I and I I just don't understand how I can be a servant for such a wonderful King as the Lord Jesus and and be a servant working in such a wonderful kingdom as the Lord Jesus as the kingdom of God and that's the privilege of every true believer. Yeah, some who just get a little more involved than others, but. Every true believer has the, that privilege, and we should be just amazed that God has allowed us to do that. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camby? Yes. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, last night someone called and was talking about the word sailor. Selah, uh, yeah. To, to my interpretation, uh, Selah is like a comma or a pause. Uh, 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 well, that that is what is uh, taught in many theological books, that it is a comma or a pause. But uh, uh, they, they can't really back that up with any scriptural... Uh, evidence that it's just a comma or a pause. That they exactly. they are speculating that that probably is what it is, and it might be. But the word itself is closest to a word I think, if I remember accurately, uh, that has to do with being with the word precious or something of that nature. So okay. uh, uh, I admit I agree with you that the word sila. Is a, is a word that nobody can say with dogmatic certainty. This is what is meant. I I don't know how how we can do that, but but we just try to get as close to what it might be as possible. You 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 you're precisely right. And brother Camp, can you explain this to me? How does one know that they're a true a true believer? The, the Bible gives us the definition if we're a true believer. And that definition is in, uh, one of the definitions is in 1 John, 1 John uh, chapter 2, I believe it is. Let me see. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, there it, God says, He that saith, I know him, and the context is emphasizing that it's saying that I am a true believer. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God, and his word is the whole Bible. In, verily in him is the love of God perfected, hereby know we that are that we are in him he that saith he abideth in him ought also himself also so to walk even as he walked in other words the nature of a true believer and the, the, when we tie that to first john chapter 3 verse 9 where it says uh, there uh, there that uh, 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 whoso is born of god does not commit sin and it's only in the 
in the life of a true believer that we've received our eternal soul in which we'll never sin again. We still live in a body that lusts after sin, but in our soul we'll never sin. And, uh, and uh, therefore, there's an intense uh, agony in our lo- life when, we, when a true believer falls into sin, because he is capable of that, but, it, but he can't live with it because... He's violating his own soul, and so it ties into the fact that he has a continuing intense desire. I want to do the will of God. I want to uh, hold the right doctrines. I, and if I hear, hear somehow that maybe I'm holding a wrong teaching, a wrong doctrine, or I find that I'm living in a way that is not altogether pleasing to God, Oh, my, I want to correct that because I want to do it. I'm happiest when I do it God's way. And that is the, that, that is the evidence that a true believer will find in his heart. And that's First John, you say? And thank you for calling and sharing. That's First John chapter 3, verse 9. And First John... Chapter 2, verse 4 through 6. Uh, these, uh, these two passages will help you to analyze how you stand before God. There is a vast difference in the lifestyle of a true believer from that uh, of someone who claims they're a true believer and are not. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we go to our next call? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, can you read Isaiah chapter 34, 1 through 6? Isaiah chapter 34, verse 1 to, not one to, all right, 1 to 6. Come near, ye nations, to hear and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of Jehovah is upon all nations. That word indignation means the wrath of God, uh, that, that, that God is getting ready to bring his wrath. And his fury, notice the next phrase, and his fury upon all their army armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. This is talking about what finally happens because of sin. The wages of sin is death. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And this is talking about the the fact that uh, uh, even though uh, uh, the people themselves are dead and don't experience anything like this, uh, in the day of judgment, all of those who have died unsaved or who are dying in the day of judgment, their carcasses or bones or, or dust or ashes or whatever remains of them are going to be thrown out to be cursed or be a curse before God, to be shamed before the eyes of God as a final a- aspect of their judgment that they uh, the, uh, even as Christ, uh, as he's demonstrating how he made payment for our sins, he was on the cross and he was cursed. Uh, a, a terrible, terrible thing. He was ashamed uh, in the eyes of all kinds of mankind as well as in the eyes of God. And that was also an integral part of the punishment. Christ endure, endured the cr- curse while he was alive. Mankind in, endures the cry, the curse when their bodies are being desecrated, and that's what this verse is talking about. They shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their host shall fall down as a leaf falleth off from the vine, and a falling from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down from upon Idumea. Idumea is a picture of ancient uh, Israel, uh, and upon the peoples of of my curse uh, to judgment. 
the sword of Jehovah is filled with blood. Uh, it uh, is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For Jehovah hath a sacrifice in Bozrah and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. Idumea and Bozrah are speaking spiritually, or it's, it's parabolic language, speaking about both the nation of Israel, that now is a nation again, and is still under the wrath of God, as well as all the churches which are under the wrath of God. Simultaneously, they are uh, being, uh, uh, they're coming under the wrath of God because they are, they have their own kind of a gospel. But now I have to say good night. You know, at this moment, I owe a great big apology uh, to all of you and to our staff even because I said good night when I was a half hour early. Oh my, I got to learn to do better. But now shall we continue our program for this last half hour by taking our next call with his question or her question. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Uh, you said, yes. Welcome uh, to Open Forum. Yes. You, your your answer was to the woman that called was if you know if you love me you'll keep my commandments. Um, now the other day you had said that we were only to adhere to nine of the commandments. Um, the Antichrist. It says in the Bible the Antichrist will think to change Yahweh. This would be his name. His appointed times. He would, the Antichrist would think to change his appointed feasts and times. Now Yeshua did fulfill the feast every single feast in the Old Testament he was a he, these were all foreshadowings of Yeshua HaMashiach now when you t I, I wanted to say please to, to my creator to please have mercy on you for trying to change his commandments in front of your uh, excuse me excuse me are you talking about the seventh day Sabbath again through the generations are you talking uh, about the seventh day Sabbath again Yes, sir. I'm yes, now we already that. talked about that tonight. But now, you lied but, to the it, people, and I wanted you to correct that because you're, we were in, we're in jeopardy. Your soul is in jeopardy, just like mine. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. We have to listen to the Bible, not to what we think or what we uh, 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 believe or whatever. We have to listen to the Bible. And the seventh day commandment, is a ceremonial law. We've already gone through that. And if you believe that, uh, if you don't understand it, I, I, all I can do is feel sorry because God has to open our spiritual eyes. And I wish you could understand. But I, I have to teach what the Bible teaches. And when the Bible tells us that the seventh day was a sign pointing to the fact that uh, God sanctifies us, uh, until you really uh, deal with that very, very seriously, you will not understand the seventh day Sabbath at all. But I have to say, go to our next caller. Welcome to Open Forum. Well, help me understand. Tell me where it was changed in the Bible. Excuse me. Please tell me where it was changed in the Bible. Matthew 28. I have an answer because the whole concept uh, ex Excuse me. Uh, we've answered that question many times, and I'll answer it once more, and then we're going to go to our next caller in Matthew 28. And we don't find this in the English Bible. We have to find it in the Greek language. It's unfortunate that the uh, English Bibles, and I don't know about Spanish or Russian or what they did in those Bibles, but in the English Bible, it says in the end of the Sabbath, singular, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, a singular word. And actually, that is an absolutely improper translation. In the end of the Sabbath, it's a plural word, a Greek word that is absolutely plural. And it's the, therefore it's the end of an era of Sabbath, that Sunday morning. As it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath. Again, exactly the same word as the first word Sabbath. It is the beginning of a new era of Sabbath, that Sunday morning. And so this clearly indicates that the seventh-day Sabbath era came to an end while Jesus was in the grave 
And on Sunday morning when he arose, he introduced us to a new Sabbath that was quite similar in some ways, but in a whole lot of ways different than the Seventh-day Sabbath. Now, uh, that verse is there, and and you have to deal with that verse. And there are other verses very similar to this that say the same thing. And so until you're ready to deal with this verse, yeah, uh, there's no point in the discussing. But thank you for calling and yeah. sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, in Matthew 27, verses 52 to 54. Uh, well, Matthew 27, verse 52, And the graves were open, and many bodies of the, of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Now, what is your question? The resurrection there, we always thought of it as Easter Sunday because that's how we were brought up. But I believe that's Jesus going back to heaven because uh, if you look in the final verse there, 54, it's the events that happened right then. So those that came out of the graves right then, not on Sunday morning. Well, excuse me. No, wait a minute. Now, it says here, the graves were open. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. Now, his right, resurrection, resurrection, excuse me, his resurrection was Sunday morning. And we have to factor in what, what all, the, the, everything the Bible teaches. We rise uh, because Christ arose. If he had not risen, then we can't arose. Uh, uh, we cannot arise, and it, 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 it is in beautiful harmony with everything else that the Bible teaches about the resurrection of Christ. Day. But thank Steve you. on the cross the same day. Uh, the, the thief was on the cross the same day, and he died, and he was, we don't know what happened to him, uh, that's that's not what we know. He went to heaven. He said, this in, his soul, be in, paradise. "In his soul, existence, he exactly. went to heaven. In his soul, existence, Jesus went. His resurrection of Jesus going back to heaven. Those just like when the earthquake on May twenty first, two thousand eleven, the souls are going to rise right then, not at some time later. Well, uh, the, the, the on May twenty one. There's going to be a great earthquake, and the and the uh, the bodies of the true believers they had died uh, all through the last thirteen thousand years, and uh, in their soul existence they went into heaven because they had been given eternal life at the moment they became saved. They were prepared in their soul to live with Christ, but not in their bodies. But uh, the uh, when their graves are open. Uh, uh, at the in that great earthquake, just like in the, when this grave, these graves were open, then the bodies will arise as, as glorified spiritual bodies, and and be caught up to be with their souls, and so that those people will be eternally with Christ. And on the other hand, the uh, the unsaved in that great earthquake, uh, they uh, they uh, many. People will, uh, 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 many bodies, all, all their bodies, whatever is left, will be thrown out just to be cursed of God or to be shamed in the eyes of God, as the Bible teaches in several places. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hi, Mr. Camping. Let's go to Genesis 1, 1 through 5, and John 1, 1 through 5, please. Well, let's look at a couple of verses here in John 1. We and read it. Time, please, it's in the beginning. Call, you, you accidentally hung up on me before getting to the verse. You started talking. Hopefully, you'll be a little more patient this time. 
Let's read. In the beginning, God created the heaven, the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now in John 1, in John 1, let's go back one, two, to the, five. In 1 to 5, in John 1, we read, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now, what is your question? Okay, Mr. Camping, before I ask my question, I have a comment. But please don't interrupt because it's very important. I'll be quick. Well, no, excuse me. What is your question? Well, this is to correct the caller who was calling you about the Sunday Sabbath to let him know he is so wrong to not believe what you're saying. I, it, it's true what you said about the Sabbath. And besides that, God has opened my eyes to another piece of information. Well, no, excuse me. Excuse me. No. I re Camping, excuse me, perfect. excuse me, you are, you are, I've asked you, what is your question? You've offered two passages here, neither have say, say anything about the Sabbath at all. They're not related to the Sabbath, and now here you you're, you're want to talk about the Sabbath. And please, uh, we, 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 we get so complicated that we, uh, nobody can figure out what, what, what we're trying to do. The fact is that uh, uh, do you understand that the seventh day Sabbath is a sign that God will sanctify us? Uh, and uh, that is, that it is true that Christ is the light of the world because He is the one who sanctifies us. But, uh, but, uh, it, 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 the seventh day Sabbath is kept to illustrate or with offered in the Old Testament to illustrate the fact that if anybody worked on, did any work on the seventh day Sabbath, they would be executed, like we read about the individual in Numbers chapter 15. And uh, that uh, that uh, uh, indicates that if anyone is trying to get saved by his own work, he is not going to, he's going to end up under the wrath of God. Now please, don't I, uh, you people are coming in with that Sabbath day question again and again and again, and you're not listening to the whole Bible. You just are not listening, and I I can't help you. I can't I can't open your eyes. I all I can do is feel sorry for you, but you call and and talk about it, and and it doesn't make any sense when we look at it in the light of the whole Bible. But thank you. And now I'm going to go to our next caller. Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping. Yes. Yes. Um, how are you this evening? I'm very well, thank you. Good. Um, sir, I wanted to um, ask you, as many of your listeners have, about, about May 21st coming up this year. Um, I know you have a lot vested in being correct about that date as many others in the past have had when they predicted the end of the world. Um, but you must realize that all of us that continue to ask you find it very important, as you do, because it is such the most important question that anyone could could ask at this point in life. So please bear with us. We all want to know the truth about it, and it's it's a bit confusing to, to everyone. But I've heard you say in regard to your past predictions that were incorrect, that it was 
similar to a homey illustration of a child on a bicycle with training wheels and that now you you've gotten it right but again I, I just brother camping I want to say I love you and I believe that you're a man of God but even without training wheels you can wreck a bike and that's what I want to ask you is, do you believe you're possibly wrecking your bike without training wheels and in five months are you going to be telling us all or some kind of way I must have been an error I don't know what happened no, no, no. excuse me excuse me there, uh, when I previous I made I did not make previous predictions I, in 1992, wrote a book that was indicating there was a high likelihood it could be 1994, but at that time, my study of the Bible was not nearly finished, and I indicated in that book that there is other information uh, that we still have to take into account, and I even indicated it might be 2011, and it was, but it was done very quickly because uh, I, I realized the command to warn the world, and if it was 1994, I better try to warn the world. But it, it showed, indeed, that I was right in saying that uh, it was a high probability, but it didn't happen. But now, as we are now talking about 19 or May 21, it's in the light of a, a tremendous number, amount of additional study, number one. Number two, it's in the light particularly of great proofs that God has given that show that it can't be anything different, as well as an understanding of a great many signs that point to the fact that that this is going to happen. Like, for example, the, the gay pride situation was planned by God as a sign that we're right on the threshold of Judgment Day. There's just a whole lot more information that is that is, has come out of the Bible since 1992 or 1994, and uh, and uh, now uh, we it, it, and God has tied it all together with such proofs that that uh, there's no way that I can say anything different than it is absolutely going to happen. If I would say anything different than that. I would be lying. I would be guilty of guilty of falsehood. I cannot say that uh, that it's just a high probability. It is going to happen. God, God's word is is true. Once we have uh, 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 completed our uh, our study it sufficiently, so that we find harmony in all the aspects of it, and especially when God gives us these proofs like the 7,000 years from the flood until our day, and, and many other proofs that we've talked about again and again. But thank you for... Brother Kempe, thank you very much for for everything that, that you're doing. Um, I cannot say that I agree with you, but I do love you, and I believe you are uh, a man of God. But I just don't agree with you, but well, I... Don't trust me. We, uh, you'll find that if you read, uh, we're almost there. Uh, uh, there, uh, it was laid out how we came to understand this, so that you don't. I don't want anybody to trust me. They, be, uh, they better trust the Bible. And but how are we going to trust the Bible? Well, uh, if we're if we're going to declare something, we better show how we got there from the Bible. And uh, and uh, then you read it for yourself out of the Word of God, because the Word of God is the authority. I am not the authority. The Bible is the authority. But if we're going to make a declaration, we better show where we got it from, from the Bible or out of the Bible. And that is exactly why we have written little books like... like uh, 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 we're almost there, or to God be the glory, or I hope God will save us, and bigger books like uh, like Time Has an End, uh, and that that came much earlier than these smaller books. But it, it, it's so that people can check the Bible itself. 
But thank you for calling and Brother sharing. Kimmy, thank you. Thank you, and thank you. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Mr. Capping. Yes. Um, uh, do you know when the... Uh, I have two questions. No, one question, please, by, for per calling. Please, go ahead with your well, most important well, question. Well, this first one had to do with... Uh, I was wondering when was the caravan coming down to San Diego. Oh, that's not a bit... Uh, okay. I don't know. I don't know what our timeline is on that, but eventually it will. Okay. And my Bible question was Ezekiel chapter um, tw chapter twenty verses nine through twelve. Ezekiel chapter twenty verses nine to twelve. Let's look at that. Ezekiel twenty. I'll take my answer off the air. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Okay, verses 9 to 12. Uh, there we read, But I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen among whom they were, in whose sight I made myself known unto them, in bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. This is Christ talking, of course, uh, that... that uh, uh, God uh, did what he did in bringing Israel out of Egypt. And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments. Statutes and judgments are, is a, are synonyms for the laws that God gave or that we find in the Bible, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. That is, if we're going to uh, obey the law of God, then that has to be our lifestyle altogether, like walking very humbly and and looking only to God for help and so on. Uh, uh, moreover, also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign, there it is, between me and them that they might know that I, the Lord, that I am the Jehovah that sanctified them. And that is... Uh, stating it very clearly that that the seventh day Sabbath was a sign that I, Jehovah, sanctify them. And the same thing is found in Exodus chapter 20, I believe, uh, that it is a sign. Uh, and uh, it is a, it is a, uh, the, no, it's a, it's, no, that it's a sign, that's not in Exodus 20, it is in, uh, it, although it's uh, it's not clear there, but in, in, in another chapter in Exodus, it's, it's also indicating that it is a sign. But it is, uh, it is therefore a part of the ceremonial law. The, a sign points to something. A sign has no substance in itself, but it points to something. And it's pointing to the fact that all the work of salvation was done by Christ, all the work of salvation. And if we think that uh, because I accepted Christ or because I was baptized in water or because I am a faithful member of this church or because I made a beautiful profession of faith, anything of that nature uh, and, th and believe that that helped me become saved, we are get guilty of doing work on the seventh day Sabbath. That is... Uh, work and and we are still subject to the wrath of God. It is a very very important sign. It is a very very important sign, and that's why, as you read the Old Testament, there are many passages where God takes issue with Israel when they broke the seventh day Sabbath law because it was a picture of people uh, in our day who are are, are believing in what they have done to get themselves saved. But shall we take our next call, please? I think it'll be our last call. Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you very much. I would like to invite all listeners to come back to the Catholic Church on May 21st after nothing happens. Please listen to and do not listen to this old man. He's 80 years yeah, old. Yeah, excuse me. Thank you me. very much. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Yes. Well, I, I, uh, I'm, I know that you mean very well. I know that you have a love for your people, but I'm sorry. 
fact is that God has not opened your spiritual eyes, apparently, to the fact that May 21 will be the day of judgment, and it is going to happen. No question at all. We could not have the tremendous proofs that God has given us about this unless it is absolutely going to happen. But now, do we have time for one more quickie? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. No, it looks like I, I, I don't think we have another caller. Well, you know, I want to then take this moment. To, here we are right early in the year 2011. That, that big year. We're only a, a little, a few days more and 19 weeks from the day of judgment. Are you pleading with God for your salvation? Wonderfully, today is the day of salvation. The Bible clearly teaches that. Oh, the mercy of God, that that is still possible right at this time. And uh, But if you walk p- proudly, if you walk, uh, well, I, I, you think I, I'm going to listen to all that? Well, okay. God resists the proud, and there's no hope. Now, even though you do actually cry out to God for mercy, and and you do plead with God, it, that is that's a work that you're doing, and it doesn't mean that that is going to help you become saved at all. But at least you will have placed yourself in an environment where God is saving people that he does still plan to save at least and you're of course you're hearing the word of God on this program and uh, that is the other uh, condition uh, environmental condition that God uses is a setting for those who are that he's saving faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God so uh, uh, at least you can plead with God and beg God And maybe you too might become a child of God because God is saving many people today. But my, it is really sad when we see the arrogancy and the pride uh, of those who say, Oh no, I know, I know it can't be that it's May 21. What are they backing it up with? What is their proof? that it's not going to be May 21, uh, that Judgment Day comes. And if it's just my thinking or just what my church teaches or what my pastor teaches, that is not very good, uh, a good uh, backing for, for, for taking a position on such an important subject. This is a super important subject. And you want to make sure you have lots of proof for it, whatever your position is. And I have to say, good night.